so thank you very much for having me here today. So I'm from Exponia. We do have pretty awesome stand outside. We do pancakes and we have a 3D printer. So please just come to visit us. So uh, yeah, I will be talking about, well, this is a little bit of clickbait. I will be talking more in you know, like larger perspective what Exponia is and then how how we uh, manage to like run stuff in in Google Cloud Engine and th this uh, sorry Google Google Compute Engine uh, so agenda we have uh, several like uh, what's several one why then how and then maybe some other what's so this is the agenda uh, yeah so let's start what is Exponia? Uh, I have uh, nice videos if they can play. Do they? Oh yeah, okay, perfect. So uh, we have something like this. It's called single customer view. It holds like uh, uh, all the data about like customer that we can track. Uh, so it's like he's all uh, the, like past, uh, past behavior and then uh, like uh, in real time tracked events and then like uh, you can predict also the behavior in the in the future inside it, and uh, you can also like uh, pretty much see what's what's going on. I think it's looped. It's looped. It doesn't. Okay. Well. Okay. No problem. Uh, so next thing, advanced analytics. Uh, you can see like most important e-commerce uh, metrics and visual de them in real time inside Exponia application. It looks pretty awesome and if you know what you want to do with the data it's probably even more awesome but we also have pretty smart people that is doing the analytics stuff for our clients and we also have pretty uh, well smart clients as well <clears throat> so um, uh, email management is other uh, nice component we do have in, in Exponia. You can uh, like make personalized emails and with other advanced features, and also like you you uh, can use like HTML editing and also like to just write something, put some other box box inside box, and then use some other other modules like recommendations and just put inside and done. Send emails, 10 millions in four hours, no problem. Uh, yes, yeah, so this is what? Omnichannel orchestration. Uh, the application is absolutely awesome for, for its uh, uh, capabilities of connect various other services like, uh, I don't know, Google Analytics, uh, Facebook stuff. We can do personalized things inside it. And uh, all you, you know, like this old stuff and yeah, well, the video is faster than I can speak, so. Yeah, API for, for the automation of stuff and in integrations for various services you, you saw inside. So it's uh, very nice to work with Exponia. Uh, other feature is uh, absolutely awesome web optimization and then like AB split testing. So the, the thing you see is you can take uh, your client's website and you can change the change the layout and, and like stuff you see uh, online and show, show to the client that look, the, this is how the website can look when you, when you use it. And then uh, we can put some JavaScript uh, snippet on it that can like change the content in real time and do the like personalization of the website for our client. Then you can use like A-B testing for, uh, yeah, you, you show some, someone the content and show other content to some other group of people and it's, uh, it's pretty useful for, for this. So our team, you can see, this is our CEO, Petya Irikovsky, and he's jumping from 12 meter high uh, tower that we had, had on a like winter summit thing. And yeah, other people standing here. I am here somewhere, but I'm not wearing shoes because I was in slippers and I don't, didn't want them to get wet, so I was barefoot. Uh, okay, so um, what Exponia was like in summer 2018? Well, I will be talking about uh, all the technical stuff. So uh, we came from, uh, from uh, uh, well, 
it was all about dedicated servers that we, we have leased from, from our like supplier. We had like 150 dedicated servers that uh, had like 2020 uh, CPU cores, 40 terabytes of RAM. Uh, I will tell you the, why the RAM was important for us. Uh, but the problem was that the, the supplier was not doing good job uh, with the networking. Also with like, uh, yeah, the servers had all just one PSU and when you run some database that spread uh, f at like 10 servers, you probably don't want to, uh, you know, lose any of those servers. And also like, you know, operations difficulties because uh, when you are running on, on hardware, the hard drive just dies and you need to rebuild the, the RAID and this kind of stuff. So uh, it was uh, really difficult for like team of five, you know, five to 10 people to maintain the infrastructure. So we decided we should uh, move on. And we moved to Google. I had a similar presentation last year, but uh, yeah. What's Exponia like today? So I was talking about the, about the spread uh, database we have, and this is it. It's called IMF. It was in, uh, in version one. Uh, it's, uh, it is really, really great uh, optimization for linear search, and we use this database for uh, storing all the events we track. Uh, also, it's uh, kind of efficient for, for memory, but do you know when your, your in-memory database is like one to one and a half terabyte uh, of RAM space and you call it efficient, well, it means it has a lot of data. Uh, so, yeah, the redundancy was done, just you have two separate replicas, you can use bo both of them in, in the same time. And also it was... Uh, uh, largely sharded, so like one one of these database can can have 20 to like 60 shards or so spread through through the servers. So our main application had 11 servers plus other 11 for other replica. It was running just this database. Uh, well, I call it pretty large spread database. If you ask me. So what we did it with. So the uh, IMF in version two is running in Kubernetes. Well, Kubernetes, uh, ephemeral containers, and you are running like, uh, you know, in-memory database in it. Well, we do. Uh, and uh, like uh, other, other thing that's, that's good about it, uh, I don't know if this is the good thing, but uh, we can dump the database in uh, uh, Google, uh, Google con storage, Google, sto uh, well, it's Google storage. Uh, and uh, uh, there we have a really nice, a nice feature that the Google is, uh, is maintaining the state of, of these dumps. So, of VA expiration of the stuff and so on. Uh, if you want to reshard this database, so you, you need, I don't know, not 20, but 30 of these shards, you can do that easily in Google because you just load uh, these shards, you just dump more, of, more shards than you have and then like reload them. It's, it's pretty simple. Um, and if you, if you want to add more resources, it's not that problematic because you just, uh, uh, you know, change some settings, apply them, Kubernetes will, will do that for you. You don't need to actually like, uh, yeah, add more, more hardware servers and then change the configs on each of them. Uh, in the la last, in the last, in the version one, uh, we did it with Ansible. Now it's, you know, like done in Kubernetes with our deployment tooling. Uh, so, uh, some questions you might have about this. So, uh, why in Kubernetes? We actually wanted to save resources. Because when you have like uh, this huge amount of servers running a database, uh, you are limited just to the amount of the servers you have. 
So you, you want to add resource, you need to buy a new server and like reinstall the whole database. In Kubernetes, you can run one Kubernetes pool for several instances of this database, and we actually do it. Uh, isn't RAM expensive? It is. Uh, that's the reason why we did it. Um, uh, because in the last setup, that was all like hardware-based, uh, there was over-provisioning of something around 50%, so these 40, 40 terabytes of RAM we had. Uh, uh, was actually needed just in half of it, so 20 terabytes probably. Uh, so in Kubernetes, when you just consolidate these databases in, in like one pool, uh, you, can, you can share the resources and have like globally only, I don't know, 20 to 30 percent over commissioning of the, the hardware you need. Um, how it looks like when it's, when it's live and it's working, it's pretty fast, so you can do like linear search in, uh, uh, well, we can say like tens of milliseconds. So you have this uh, large amount of 1.5 terabyte of data stored in, 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 uh, in memory. And uh, you need to like filter stuff from it. You just run a query and it, it, uh, it runs for several tens of milliseconds and you, you get, get the result in your application and you can use it. That's the reason why Exponia is like real time and really fast. Uh, and also like Expo Exponia is built around this, uh, this in-memory database. Uh, huh, what do you do when it dies? Uh, when the database dies, um, it's not usable. Well, uh, in the old setup, it loaded f when it was from, from something that was more, more persistent. We used Mongo. That took like two weeks. So it's not really uh, the downtime, downtime you want. Um, in the, when you use like dumps that was dumped on, on local hard drives, it was about like two hours, still pretty large downtime. And in Kubernetes using uh, like this, uh, uh, this sto uh, Google storage, uh, it actually is in, uh, from seconds to minutes. So, so you, can, uh, you can actually load the database from the dump uh, that is like one and a half terabyte in RAM in probably something like three minutes. Well, that, that's probably a nice number, uh, I, I would say. Um, yeah, and uh, how it is when it's dead? When it's dead, you have another repli replica, so that's not that problematic. Well, sometimes uh, even the second replica dies and then there is a problem, but uh, uh, if it's like two weeks problem, that's a really large problem. But two minutes problem is uh, not acceptable, but uh, yeah, we can call it nice. Um, as I was talking, campaigns are uh, other, other part of application that's really like huge and uses this in-memory database in, in its full. Um, uh, the old setup was using Celery with combination with RabbitMQ. Uh, this was working pretty well, um, but uh, the, the RabbitMQ, uh, we needed to run at least like uh, in highly available mode, like three, three nodes of uh, RabbitMQ servers, and it was really resource consuming. Also, also the performance of this was not really stellar. Um, and also, uh, there, there is problem with, with running Celery, uh, the, the way we, we used it, that you, you couldn't like prioritize tasks enough, so we need to have like pools of, of standard workers that are doing like sh the tasks that are, uh, you know, serialized, and then like other priority, priority workers that, uh, uh, you need when you like trying to, to do some scheduled tasks uh, uh, in time or you got some, some event that something should be sending emails uh, in, well, in the time that it's supposed to. Um, and also uh, the, like the persistency of, uh, of the, this task that should be, made, should be 
uh, executed was stored in uh, in uh, Mongo. So if all three of these RabbitMQ servers died, uh, and it was uh, actually happening like often um, be because of the workload there, uh, we sometimes hit even like. Uh, uh, 12,000 messages per second on uh, uh, every three of those servers. So the workloads were pretty high and it was at the, like, the edge of the performance of RabbitMQ uh, that, uh, well, it can handle. So it couldn't handle anymore. Um, so what we did was changing the, the scheme like from, from the beginning. Um, also, we need to run that in Kubernetes. So uh, the, the, the thing that didn't change was that per persistent tasks still still stored in Mongo. But we actually uh, edit uh, like campaign scheduler. The scheduler is written in Go. Uh, sorry for just Python lovers. We love also Go. Um, the scheduler uh, is performing uh, much better. Much better is, uh, what was it, 100 times faster? Yeah, something like 100 times with more capacity than, than the old setup with uh, three node uh, RabbitMQ cluster. And also it uh, does not uh, need any resources, we can say, like in the scale of the RabbitMQ and this one. The RabbitMQ servers was like eight cores and 30 gigs of RAM each. So this is just, you know, like three replicas of, of this Go, Go scheduler running Kubernetes. So it's like nothing. Uh, yeah, and also like uh, we, we changed the salary for, for workers written in Python. So hooray, Python lovers. <laughs> Uh, uh, and it also like uses 17% less RAM, um, uh, but still the, the old setup with RabbitMQ and Celery is kind of p present in an application still, uh, but just for like uh, several inside uh, inside stuff in the in the application. Uh, but we changed the we changed the RabbitMQ for Redis. And uh, it, it performs well because uh, it's not that uh, hard on workloads. Uh, what's uh, mm, also like uh, in, in Google Cloud, you have more more options for uh, like uh, uh, well debugging and monitoring your stuff. Uh, so uh, it was it was easy enough for us to implement a logging to to stack driver uh, with logs in stack driver you can do very nice things and like even see better inside what's what's your application is doing uh, as I was talking like uh, uh, the go scheduler uh, is more reliable and like absolutely magnitudes, magnitudes cheaper than, than, the, than the old old setup with Celery and RabbitMQ. Uh, and uh, also it's, it, well, easy for, for scaling uh, because uh, we can also use like autoscaler that's, that's in, inside and uh, we actually are using, using it. Uh, yeah, and that's like also Google Cloud platform itself is pretty nice. Okay, uh, so next, like, why, why we, why we even tried? I, I was kind of talking about this all the time. Why we did this, but uh, yeah, um, <clears throat> I will talk about like the the scale of uh, Exponia infrastructure. There is like uh, uh, now in uh, well, in present time, I can say. Uh, so we now use in in one uh, Google project something like 350 servers, but these virtual machines there are just uh, for several of the databases uh, that that we run. So so these Mongo servers. We also use Kafka, 
and we don't uh, use Kafka in Kubernetes for now, but we might. Um, then there is like Redis and some Elasticsearch servers that, that, are, that are parts of our application as well. But then the, like the interesting part is that, uh, yeah, as I was talking about, we use uh, Google Kubernetes engine. And uh, the, Google, the Google Kubernetes engine we use uh, is of uh, 100 plus nodes. And that's pretty large installation of it. Um, we use separate uh, like node pools for, for, the, for the application. Uh, and uh, also in this, uh, this setup, we use separate node pools for, for these uh, in-memory databases. So one for, for each replica. And they, as I was talking, they share resources. So this one, this one uh, large Kubernetes uh, uh, cluster uh, is, is used for, for more than just one Exponia, Exponia instance. Uh, you, can, you can imagine that uh, like uh, if you go to app exponia.com, that's our main, uh, main instance, but we also sell like private instances for our like largest clients. So we have something like more than 20 of, of these private instances alongside with, uh, with our, our own like uh, uh, application that we use or instance that we, that we use for like shared clients. And they all uh, are running on this one Kubernetes engine. Uh, so 100 nodes, pretty large installation. Yes, we did have problems with Google managing the service uh, because uh, the, you should not be allowed to change the configuration of this Kubernetes engine that Google runs. Oh, well, you should not, but uh, actually you kind of can, but uh, well, we can talk about it uh, probably privately because I'm not supposed to talk about that. Um, yeah, and what's, what's very cool about uh, uh, Google and like Google Cloud Platform is their network. Someone, has, someone hates it, someone loves it. Uh, and it's because it's not actually IP network. It's a software-defined network that looks like an IP, but you can't, can't do any, any of these like uh, multicast or, or broadcast on, on this kind of network. Uh, that's not that problematic if you don't work with some pretty obscure stuff, but uh, still it can be a turn off for someone. Um, but it works pretty well. You can use uh, like network tags for like routing traffic inside. Uh, and also like it has really, really great uh, firewall uh, that's also using these tags. So uh, it can work pretty well for us, and it does. Um, uh, also, Google Network is, is fun that uh, you can imagine it like uh, the internet itself. So Google built their own internet, um, and uh, uh, we use global load balancers. That's pretty. That's pretty cool because they are like they are always near you. And uh, it's because uh, when, you, when you go to their IP, it shows up uh, ge geographically near as, as possible to, to your uh, location. So the, like the uh, latencies here are, are pretty, well, minuscule, we can say. Oh, wow, okay. Oh, cool, we are back. Uh, yeah, and uh, the, the main part is that uh, the, the operations uh, that we need to do in, in Google Cloud, when using Google Cloud, is much, much less than we needed when we had like only dedicated servers. Uh, and that's probably, uh, well, not the most important, but certainly very important reason why, why we even uh, 
wanted to, to change uh, something with our own infrastructure because uh, it was really eating the uh, DevOps time, uh, like the huge amount of it. Uh, and it was actually like probably 60% of, of the time that DevOps guys uh, like was spending to just to maintain the infrastructure itself. And uh, our service provider was uh, very funny because it sometimes uh, like it was uh, Christmas 2017 and uh, yeah, one guy had like uh, on duty and, and uh, he needed to solve an issue that like uh, rates on four servers got corrupted in the same time and it was like uh, December 26 or so in the, in the like morning and it was like, okay guys, uh, can you help me with it? Uh, yeah, and this was uh, pretty much all the all the time with, with this provider. Uh, yeah, in Google, you don't encounter problems like this, you encounter other problems. Uh, like, uh, well, with Google, uh, all, the feature is, all the features are alpha, several are beta, and then the others are deprecated. So that's also a sometimes problem. <laughs> But, uh, well, we, we managed and uh, we are happy. Uh, uh, and the, the other, other part we can talk about, um, why is Google awesome? Why is Exponia in summer 2019 awesome? And why it always will be? Um, uh, Google Cloud Console itself is uh, really good for, for like uh, prototyping stuff and it's fast, you can just click on things and it appears in seconds, then you can just delete them. Uh, well, it's not that useful for like running production stuff, but certainly is awesome for, for prototyping stuff. Also, uh, our AI guys are using uh, very many uh, Google specific uh, services and are happy with them and also like clients are happy because they, they work as we well advertised and that's good. Uh, also, um, you can use uh, infrastructure as a code systems like Terraform and we use it a lot. Uh, that you can you can spawn your virtual machines and uh, also the the Kubernetes engine and networking firewalls, uh, service accounts, pretty much anything that's inside uh, inside Google you can use it, um, use it for, and that's that's very good for us, and we use it a lot. Uh, then AVX as a deployment tool for services, well. We use it for, for databases, uh, so when you install the server, well, you spawn it with Terraform, then you use AVX. Uh, for those who don't know, AVX is uh, Ansible Tower, just the community version of it. Um, uh, and also we use it for like security updates that, that are, that is really, really helpful when you need to update like 80 servers at once. Uh, yeah, and then um, the funny part uh, of, of our system is uh, our own in-house, uh, in Python written deployment tool and also, yeah, um, diagnostics and debugging tool for Kubernetes. We could use something like Helm. But uh, Helm does like three or five things and we needed the tooling to do like 15 things. So, well, like uh, every other company here, uh, we wrote our own. Uh, well, you may like be happy to sit there because I will be showing how, it, how this works in a few minutes. Uh, then uh, GitLab. We use GitLab for automated builds as it should be used. And then also we use uh, GitLab for 
deployments, not to production. We use it just to deploy, uh, deploy the, the new uh, and pre-production stuff to development uh, environments that is, well, not really one-to-one -to, -one to production, but uh, still pretty similar. And in the future, we can actually use it for, for also like production, but uh, I don't know if we want to like just now. So uh, yeah, I think it's time for the demo. I will just change the, change the notebooks. Sorry to interrupt this. Mm -hmm. Cool, it's as, as small as you want. Okay, perfect. Where is the, oh yeah, here. So, uh huh. Oh, some of this. So, um, I will be showing you uh, the the deployment tooling we use. Uh, so, uh, let's say we want to deploy new version of our application. So we do something like this. Okay, it's open there. I will do this and this. Okay, thank you very much. And then, yeah, install. Really, I type this. Do, 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 do. I hope I opaked all the passwords and done. So uh, I don't know if I can show you, I probably can't, so I will not, uh, how many containers just uh, got killed and uh, spawned again, but I certainly can say it was a genocide. So uh, uh, this application is running uh, about, I think, configured resources, updated resources, so 19. I don't know, it, it, it's about 100, 150 containers, something like that. Uh, so uh, as you can see, this tooling is really powerful. Well, actually the Kubernetes itself is this powerful. So uh, the, the thing this is doing is only like, you change uh, the configuration and you just apply it. It will render the config files and update the configuration of Kubernetes uh, that, uh, uh, that we are running and that's done. The Kubernetes will pull the images, uh, kill the old images, start the new ones, get the config and the application is running again. So pretty fast and uh, uh, it may see like th this is not much uh, for some of you, but uh, in the old setup, uh, we used Ansible to deploy the new, uh, new versions of application. And it could run uh, from something from half an hour to some instances, even like three hours. So if you imagine the, the speed up of the deployment process from like two hours to something like, what was it, 20 seconds, 15 seconds? Well, it's, uh, it's I think, pretty nice. And uh, yeah, this probably is the demo I wanted to show you. So I will just uh, give this uh, here and then here and then here. Oh, no, this one. So thank you. <laughs> <laughs> This is probably not a good Slido, but Slido will be somewhere here. Thank you for that check. Oh, yeah. Okay. What were the deciding factors for you to choose GCS over, for example, Amazon Web Services? <clears throat> um, uh, well, the deciding f factors uh, were that uh, GCP actually worked for us. And we had uh, previous experiences with AVS, and it was kind of good enough, but uh, 
Uh, we ran a development uh, infrastructure in AVS before. We even like was uh, was going to like decide if we want to move on. Uh, then, uh, well, actually, we just made a hackathon during weekend with our founder and some other guys, uh, and was trying the like if we can use it, if we cannot. And then someone, somehow, the, the, our founder came and, uh, guys, uh, what do you want to do, AVS or Google Cloud? Someone said Google Cloud, so we are in Google Cloud. That's not probably the answer you wanted, but uh, that's uh, kind of how it was. <laughs> how long did it take for you to fully migrate uh, to, to the Google Cloud? What were the biggest issues you faced while doing so? Uh, how long did it take? Last year, uh, I had a, I had a similar presentation like this, and it uh, its uh, its theme was to the Google Cloud in 80 days, and I was counting on the fact that during uh, PyCon SK 2018, we would already be migrated to Google Cloud fully. We were not. <laughs> Uh, but uh, now we kind of are, we have some residual, residual instances still running in some kind of old architecture, but it's more, more of an on-premise, uh, uh, on premise, so we need to like wait for the client to decide. Uh, but how long did it take? I, I would say like uh, something around a year. So from November 2017, when we like started to talking about it, uh, to the like end of the year 2018, when there was like nearly everything in, we can say probably a year. What was the most painful thing about Kubernetes from your point of view? Hmm. Well, getting questions why Kubernetes and why, why not anything else. No, no, no. Uh, well, Kubernetes, uh, I don't, I can't say we had like very many like painful, painful spots in this because the, the application already was kind of uh, uh, composed of, of microservices, we could call them. Uh, because in old old architecture, it was running uh, these wor workers like uh, uh, separate instances of them, and uh, uh, supervisor D was running them. So it's it already looked like uh, not really microservices, but certainly like split uh, split small applications that were doing doing their their jobs. So porting that to Kubernetes was. Uh, very hard, but not absolutely insanely impossible. Impossible, sorry. <laughs> and how much work and what type did migrating to GCP reduce? So the opposite. Ah, did migrating. How much work and type did the migration reduce? Uh, yes, yeah, so, so uh, the question is about uh, how we are more efficient now, is it, is it right? That's what it sounds like, if someone would like to okay. clarify. Well, uh, we are more efficient in like, uh, uh, as, I was, as I was talking about it, in these like operations tasks uh, around it, because I can say it on an example. Uh, in uh, this like summer 2018, there was, uh, we can say like nine DevOps guys, we can say, uh, and we had uh, uh, less than 10, we had 10, I can say, uh, Exponia instances running uh, on, on this hardware platform. Uh, and now we have 25 and only like uh, four to six kind of DevOps guys running the infrastructure itself. And then, of course, like other developers and, and, and people like uh, uh, doing, doing other tasks, but just the operation stuff around it. So uh, 
uh, this can be an example, and I will give you a second one. For example, um, take you have a pretty large uh, MongoDB instance, pretty large, I mean like the data is uh, something around two terabytes, and uh, you are running on a hardware. What will you do when like a secondary of this instance dies? Well, uh, you can rely on the replication or in the Mongo itself to like re replicate the whole database uh, by itself. It can do it, but actually, uh, as I am now doing for past month, it can't. Uh, so uh, the only other possi possibility for you is to like write to the to the uh, people running your servers that they need to like add another disk to your server. You then do something like a snapshot. You can transfer then the snapshot to the other other machine. Then try to like uh, start the replication with uh, just the uplock. The uplock should be I don't know. Uh, long enough to like uh, uh, not got the secondary data to stale, and uh, it it already took me like uh, one month of just trying to replicate the secondary of of this large MongoDB uh, in uh, Google Cloud. Uh, you can you can do it uh, that yeah secondary dies you just like, throw the server away. Uh, then you will, uh, you can do like live snapshot of the data, data disk of the primary. You can't, you can't, don't even need to like stop the, the Mongo running on the primary. Then spun, spin up the server with like the, from the snapshot, just do like the, the hard drive from the snapshot, spin up the server. Register it like a secondary. It just finds the fun. They just find each other, and uh, in in seven, in some I don't know. It's like 20 minutes when the 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 secondary just uh, comes alive, and you have your running uh, replica. Uh, so yeah, from probably like uh, a week of negotiating with people and do, doing operation stuff, you are now at about like a half an hour. How many sys guys was, were needed to take care of uh, the, uh, the legacy solution? Yeah, I, uh, well also like uh, IT, IT structure changed, but I can say like we, we was like eight to 10, 10 uh, sys admins, we can ca call it. And now, uh, like my team is is of three people. Other other three guys are doing like platforms. So so the Kubernetes stuff, we can say six guys now. Uh, yeah, so less than before. So legacy probably uh, around ten, and now around six. But we are two and a half times larger than we were like before. In terms of cost efficiency, what is the comparison between using GKE and legacy architecture? <laughs> the direct versus indirect costs, and eventually, was there any fixed cost? Well, uh, I will be talking about direct costs first. So direct costs, uh, at first we, uh, we counted that the new solution would be like eight times the price of the legacy one. Eight times what, uh, well, not actually, acceptable uh, but with uh, like good optima optimization uh, and like uh, not being uh, well that plentiful on resources resources we don't need we ended up at something around like from one and a half to two times the the costs but actually we are now like two and a half times larger than than we was before so uh, yeah, it's uh, not, not not that fair comparison, but I, I can say like the uh, if the legacy was as large as we are now, it would be uh, pr probably like seventy percent, maybe f from fifty to seventy percent of this cost. And uh, yeah, the indirect ones, as I was talking about, is the operations cost. So the operations cost 
is now like really small uh, comparing to compared to to the legacy setup. We'll do only one more question. What did you miss in Helm? Uh, well, I'm not the Kubernetes guy, so I can't answer this uh, this one. But we also, from my perspective of view, uh, we needed the tool that can do. Uh, not only Kubernetes specific things like, um, you know, like uh, deployments, configuration and uh, config maps and this kind of stuff, but also like uh, spin up several services in Google itself. That's sometimes done through the Kubernetes itself, but sometimes it's not. So probably this is the thing. But uh, if you need to know that, just uh, step inside our, our stand and there will be Kubernetes guys uh, keen on to talk to you. Thank you so much, Fratisek. Thank you so much for listening.